about the other day when we were in lab, that even if you just looked at a, if you just committed to learning three or four a day between now and then, which you kind of have it by the time you come, instead of putting yourself under tremendous stress uh, about, you know, waiting to the last minute. How many of us would say we're procrastinators? <laughs> um, okay, so we really try to fight that uh, and not do that. But okay, now, um, if you did not get the list the other day, I think I came this out to people who were at the other day. Um, make sure you do get that list, okay? Um, we know that we have uh, 200, as adults, we have about 206 bones as adults. As infants, as neonates, we are born with about 270. Well, what happens? Do we lose some of them? They learn to lose. Yeah, they end up fusing together. And so as they are ending up fusing together, you know, they sort of become one solid bone. And a good example of that is one that we went over the other day in lab with the skull was the mandible, um, but also the frontal bone. So there are pieces kind of when they're born and then they end up fusing together. So, so that's why we talk about uh, neonates having 270 bones, but adults typically having about 200, 206, 278 units, 206 as adults. Okay, now we we kind of went through some of the, um, oh, this is chapter eight, I'm on the wrong chapter. Okay, all right, relax. Right, y'all keep me, y'all keep me honest, okay. That's all right, I don't know, it's all right. Can I mention we're in this together? That means that y'all, y'all have to keep me straight too. All right, so so we talked about uh, bone tissue, osseous tissue, osseous sites, and, and we've mentioned right now three different types of bone cells. We've mentioned osteocytes, obviously, which are mature bone cells, and we mentioned osteoblasts, which are going to be early bone cells that become osteocytes, and we talked about a special kind of bone cell called osteoclast. What did osteoclast do? What did osteoclast do? Yeah. Somebody's saying it secretes HCL, it secretes this hydrochloric acid, and, and its properties function is really kind of to dissolve bone. And um, when we were talking about the skeletal system, we said we get we get these obvious things to do it, protecting visceral organs and protecting these vital structures that we need uh, being protected. Also giving support and, and help and allowing for movement. Without the skeletal system, we really wouldn't have much movement. We would be just quivering masses, right? We wouldn't have much movement at all. But because we do, we we can um, we have agility, and you lose it when you age. When you age, so enjoy it now while you're young. Is what I'm saying. But anyway, we also know it does more than that. Inside of bones, um, we have red bone marrow, which we said is where we're going to find the stem cells that become what. Adult blood cells. Name some blood cells. Red cells, erythrocytes, white blood cells, leukocytes, and there are a lot of different types of leukocytes. And platelets, right? Platelets. And so the stem cells that will be that have the potential to become any of those cells that I just mentioned are found in red bone there. So uh, that's important for you to know. And then we talked about it being a mineral reservoir and helping with pH balance. I didn't maybe talk about yet, and even detoxification. But let me um, remind you to look. I know you didn't look at it before today, but go back and look at your notes about how calcium, blood calcium levels are maintained in homeostasis and what it takes for that. Because on Tuesday, no, what day is this? So we meet Tuesday. Thursday. So on Tuesday, y'all's lecture quiz would be in any of these notes we talked about the other day, including what we end up talking about today. I think you have a little um, a little link to the lecture, don't you? So review that. Make sure that you could discuss blood calcium homeostasis, why it's important, why imbalances of calcium can take you out of this world today, why our paramedics have to have to be careful seeing somebody with carpal tunnel syndrome where they are they're uh, in tetany. <coughs> what was tetany? It's going to be a sustained muscle yes. contraction uh, that you're in with no refractory period. And if it's affecting your carpal, which is wrist, carpal pedal feet, if it's affecting those, well, that's one thing. You're in a fetal position. 
and you know you, you might not look too great in that position but what we worry about is that it's affecting the air the muscles for air movement and the larynx which is going to be the muscles that are necessary for speech right so those muscles clamp down they close off your airway and also heart arrhythmias rhythm means that you got some beat right <laughs> rhythm things something can rhythm we like for our hearts to be in rhythm right a, a rhythm, rhythmic beat if you have an arrhythmia it means your heartbeat is not beating like it should be um, in rhythm and when you go into certain arrhythmias sometimes your system will just send a signal for the heart to do what stop that's called cardiac arrest and can these electrolytes play a role in that Mm -hmm. yeah, that's why they've got to be balanced. Blood calcium homeostasis is one of the most uh, particular ones. It's the one of the most finicky ones. So do we want to be in hypercalcemia? No. Do we want to be in hot hypocalcemia? <coughs> no. And can we sometimes get signs and symptoms of it occurring? Yeah, we've got to correct that. Um, hi, Maya. So, um, so great. Now, as far as pH balance and detoxification occurs, occur, if you guys have a clinical insight, and I do want you to have read it maybe before we even get to next Tuesday, but it talks about, um, it talks a little bit about what I've already introduced to you, and that's that bone is two-thirds this inorganic matter that makes it harden, right? And that, that complex are these calcium phosphate, calcium carbonate complexes. So the bone, the skeletal system is a great place for all of these minerals to be balanced. But what can happen is if pH balance gets off, if somebody is in acidosis, which you all know what that means, if you don't go back and review my discussion on pH balance, or in alkalosis, then the bones are going to be affected. They're going to be trying to pull these phosphates out. And what can end up happening is if too much gets pulled out, can the bone health be affected, adversely affected? Yeah, so it can. So it can end up leading to uh, what is referred to as uh, rickets in kids and malaysia in adults. So osteomalacia. So you guys look at that and, and take a look at our boats are doing with this mineral reservoir pH balance. They're doing a lot more than what's obvious, you know. They really are. So this is your skeletal system and your skeletal health. Now, when we start looking at these bones, I, I had it to you all in the class the other lab the other day that you guys aren't going to get a full skeleton. You just have to be labeling bones on the skeleton, right? And by the way, this lab, just like the lab today, is a practical where I'm going to set up the microscopes and, and it's going to have to be kind of ordered, but y'all will be able to do it. Um, some of you will be in here just feeding into the scopes and looking at the scopes and telling me, telling me what tissue type. It's called a practical lab, right? So y'all do that for physiology, but you'll also do a practical lab for these bones. I'm going to have that most of them are going to be disarticulated. There will be no skeleton in view that, that's articulated, meaning you're going to have to be able to pick up a bone and you're going to have to look at the bone and think, no other bone has a head like that. This is the femur. I know that's the femur. You're going to have to be able to do that. You're going to have to pick up like a little bone, and even these two won't be articulated, but you're going to have to pick up a little bone and you're going to see, oh, it's not a little round, look at that little round head. Nothing looks like that except the radius. Are you going to have a word bag? No. 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 So today, while you all are taking turns doing the practical in that room, in this room, I'm going to have out those disarticulated bones and the articulated skeletons so that you can take the disarticulated bone and go up to the skeleton and say, oh, well, I see that this is the radius and the radius is right here. This is where it's situated, you know, in situ is where it should be. But I wouldn't have to have it in situ. I know what this bone looks like. This is going to help you uh, if you ever do orthopedics and you, you get, maybe you should have them labeled. But if they're not labeled and they come to you and they're like x-rays and stuff, you're not going to have to be told what bone it is. You're going to look at it and think, oh, I know that's the proximal head of the femur, or that's the proximal, or that's the distal uh, head, that's the distal end of the fibula. Right? Because you, you're going to recognize bones, disarticulated. Okay, so. 
So we know we have a lot of different shapes of bones, and that's fine, and we've got that. Now, when we think about these, these bones and like the physiology of bones, if I were to take a little piece of this bone, like this, this little square you see here, and blow it up and look at it, if I just sort of took that little piece out and looked at it, what we see is that bone has these outer compact areas. Did we look at compact bone in histology? We did. It has these compact bone areas that are sandwiching um, what is the spongy bone area. Now you might look at that and think to yourself, well, wow, bone would be better if it was just solid compact. Maybe it would be doing its job better if it were, but it wouldn't. And let me tell you why, and I just trust this because I trust people much better that do physics and stuff because why would they do it unless they were whatever. So anyway, but no, I trust this, just this, this motion and energy and how energy is dispersed. Think about if something hit you in the head, right? I'm not sure we've all gotten hit in the head before. If you have siblings, you have gotten hit in the head. So anyway, something hits you in the head and that energy of that motion hit, if it hit, and it hits the compact bone. And just because of how energy disperses, it's going to, it's going to obviously go through that, but it's also going to go spread, be spread out. Some of that energy will be spread out. So what happens is the spongy bone gives it a little bit of, of resistance or a little bit of give, if you will. So it sort of stops the energy in motion here, dispersing it out. So it's not likely it would break all the way through. But if it were solid, would it be likely it could break, more likely that it could break all the way through? Mm -hmm. So it's actually protective. It's more protective to have compact bones sandwiching spongy bones. Uh, and I, like I said, I take their word for it about the energy and how it's dispersed. But I do, I, and it kind of makes sense even. Now, um, also think about this. If your bones were all solid, compact, they would be heavy. Wouldn't they? They would be maybe too heavy. For they're heavy enough, which they are, aren't they? So they would be maybe even too heavy. So they would be, if it weren't like this, they would be uh, heavier, and they wouldn't even be as protective. So we're kind of glad of this, aren't we? I want you to know a couple of terms for long bones, and long bones are going to be bones that have sort of this appearance. Now, now obviously. Um, you know, obviously when you're looking at a tibia, and this is a tibia, but when you're looking at a tibia and you think about that as being a shinzo, you look at, you, you think, okay, yeah, of course that's a long bone. <laughs> and a a long bone, and a long bone, right? So you sort of think about those as being long bones, but even these uh, metacarpals are long bones, and even phalanges are kind of long bones. And what I want, because they have that these, these characteristics, but I want you to know two terms. I want you to know that diathesis means the shaft, a diaphysis is a shaft. So if you hear that someone has a proximal end break of the diaphysis of a certain bone, which you all know where to look. Proximal means toward the what? Toward the trunk, right? Toward the trunk or where it's connected. This is a so proximal near that. Uh, and then if it's in the diaphysis, you're kind of looking at the shaft, right? But suppose you heard that it was an epiphyseal break. And so the epiphysis, or the epiphyseal ends here, the epiphyseal plate. This is where the, these are the ends of long bones, the epiphysis or the epiphyseal ends. These are where the growth plates are. And when you all hear growth, y'all have all heard growth plates before, haven't you, of long bones. This is where the lengthening occurs in a long bone, the lengthening. These are where the special cells are that undergo mitosis that allow for the lengthening of long bones. It's in the epiphyseal plate, which is called the growth plate. Now, by the time your growth plates close, you've reached your full lengthening pot potential, right? Is that right? All right, so if there's an injury in the epiphyseal, uh, in the epiphyseal, or the epiphyseal ends of a bone, and you've got that on the chart, you're looking, you're thinking about that. Your worry is, is if that individual has not reached full growth potential. We are bilateral creatures. So if there's been a break in the epiphyseal plates of someone who hasn't reached full growth potential, could that cause a ton of trouble? It really could. And so the worry there is, uh, you know, the worry there is real. You know? Uh, and I do want to say this, this is actually true. I, I, maybe somebody could, could uh, 
tell me your experience. You know, we talk about specialists now and how so much is being discovered every single day in medicine. Don't have chosen fields that you can never sit back and think, oh, I made it. I put those books away. Because you've got to be lifelong learners. You've made a commitment to that because so much is changing all the time. Um, but especially in areas like orthopedics. And so um, there's the specialty of orthopedics. There's a pediatric orthopedics and an adult orthopedics. And I'm going to tell you, they're completely two different things. So if you had a, um, if you had, if you had somebody who, who was a child that has an orthopedic injury to bone, to joint, to muscle, to whatever, if there's any way possible, they should see a pediatric orthopedist because it really is different in how they're going to be treated and how they're going to be, well, that's how they're going to be treated, diagnosed and treated. So any questions about that? Young girls. At puberty, what hormone levels do you know that start spiking at puberty for young girls? Estrogen. Estrogen plays a big role in our heart in our um, skeletal health. Y'all have probably heard that before because you hear about people, women who go through menopause, then their their bone health can be affected, adversely affected after menopause. Have you heard that before? Mm -hmm. uh, I think you have that. And so some people get estrogen replacement therapy. Hormone replacement therapy or estrogen replacement therapies, if they're, if, especially if they're really at risk for skeletal health issues. But so you've heard about estrogen and it plays a role in skeletal health. Um, at puberty, it's also going to play a role in the linking. So this is this is going to it's going to affect these epiphyseal plates. But as soon as the, it affects them, it's going to close them off. This is why you can sometimes have uh, in the eighth grade. I'm so sorry for young males in the eighth grade because the girls can look twenty. And the guys still look like they're in eighth grade, you know. So had it, I was this height at twelve. Usually, when your periods get regular, because estrogen's been going before then, but when your periods become regular, if you've reached your full life potential, you're not getting any taller. Did anybody get any taller once their menstrual cycles got level? Anybody in here get any taller after that? Now, men though at puberty, they're getting estrogen pumped out, right? Did anybody get any taller after menstrual? Cycle? Yeah. Uh, maybe just some, and some people don't really, some women don't get really uh, level cycles until like 16, 17, 18. A lot of times you see them being taller, you know, because they're growing, they're still growing, but they, they haven't closed off yet. Um, males, though, don't have that, so they continue to grow in height. Your textbook's going to say until 18, but I've known males grow in height until their early 20s. They're continuing to get taller, so um, it just depends. But this is a, a di real difference in skeletal health. So that again is going to mean that when there's injury or trauma to a young girl, maybe she is still young, 14, 15, but husband her epiphyseal plates have what closed. All right. Okay. Um, those are just some terms. Now. Um, so we've talked about these bones, didn't we? And I went through the bones. Again, why do we have this composition? One-third organic, two-thirds, because it makes it what? Actually makes it stronger than if that percentage was off. We talked about that, did we? Didn't we? We talked about that actually if it's, if it's even more the hard stuff, that would be bad because it would make the bones brittle, wouldn't it? Whereas if there's more of the organic, that does give tensile strength, but if there's too much more than that, percentage then it makes the bone softer. So this hopefully may also uh, made a lot of good sense to you. All right, now there are other minerals as well stored in bone, so rubber deficient or whatever. This is again, as we said, an incredibly important mineral reservoir. Um, all right, we saw this, didn't we? This is just one little osteon, but we saw lots of them, didn't we? We're going to see those today in compact bone. Yep, I talked about spongy bones. So this is the head, the proximal head of the femur. Um, and this has this nice ball here that fits into a cup of the oscoxae, which is the hip bone, it's the oscoxae. So this is fitting into this uh, hip bone, this oscoxae, in a nice little way so that it, you can get tons of rotation. So, you know, you can, it's not just that you can raise your left knee anteriorly. You can do it to the side. Don't, don't do that. But you know, you can move your leg all around, right? And it's because of that 
it's because of that ball and socket kind of joint right there. Now, because of that, though, and because we are primates, we are bipedal, we very early learn how to get up from crawling, right, and start to stand. And you can imagine the pressure that is going to be exerted as it's, and again, this is a physics thing, but as it's exerted, um, the energy gets exerted just by standing upright mm -hmm. and the pressure just puts on it. So what it, it, it's kind of beautiful as long as everything's healthy and aligned and symmetrical, right and left. But if everything is, most of that most of that pressure is going down on this compact inner. Do you see that? Most of it's there, and that's going to be fine. But this is why what it makes such a problem when somebody has injuries of one, like that their right knee, and so they're giving kind of to that. But what's it doing to this side? It's causing problems on the other side now, right? So, so we need to keep them down. Okay, so whatever. But we, we so we kind of talked about that. And even though we know we've got this compact bone sandwiching spongy bone, the design is perfect for this. So if we look in a, at an adult articulated skeleton, like you're seeing here, the red bone marrow in an adult is going to be found in these irregular bones, like the sternum, the oscoxae, the right oscoxae, the left oscoxae. So when they would go to get bone marrow, they used to they used to would go to the sternum, but you know it takes some pressure to get into that uh, through that compact bone. So now a lot of times they go into what's called this ileal fossa, um, which is a depression of this oscoxae, the hip bone, and they go in and they get bone marrow samples if they need, if they need to. Um, that's where the stem cells are found for bone for blood cells. In a child. You can find red bone marrow even in these longer bones, but as we age those longer bones, the marrow becomes yellow marrow, which is mostly artifacts, and that's normal. That's a, that's normal. Um, that yellow marrow can convert back even in adulthood to red marrow if the person's under tremendous stress, and and that tremendous stress is usually like kind of horrific things that are happening over long periods of time, like starvation. Uh, or cancer, or you know, whatever, and it can, can kind of convert back. But anyway, yellow marrow, typically normal situations, red marrow here. Um, it's, this is FYI, this next part is about, about how bone lays down. So I'm not going to ask you anything about embryonic development, but I do want to just show you because it is kind of fascinating. Uh, everywhere, everywhere on the fetus, and this is at 12 weeks. At 12 weeks, everywhere in a fetus, that there would will be bone someday. There's cartilage as a blueprint first. So cartilage lays down first. It lays down first as the blueprint, and then what comes to feed in in a couple of different sites are going to be these early bone cells, and then bone will start replacing the cartilage where it needs to be. This is why. You know, when we think about the odds, uh, and maybe some of you are mothers, I know, uh, and you hear about, like, can you feel the way through? You know, they'll ask you questions, or people will ask you, have you felt movement yet? Well, that embryo is moving all the time. So there's always movement happening. But you have this musculature that you can't really feel that movement, and also it's like a little uh, tissue block, so the movement you can't really feel, it's not causing any impact. But as soon as enough bone starts laying down in the cartilage blueprint, and now it's got that two-thirds, you know what bone feels like, it's hard, isn't it? So then when the fetus is moving, because now it's a fetus at this time, right, from nine weeks to full birth, um, usually, it's usually enough by the 16th week that there's enough bone replacing cartilage that when there's kicking happening, are you feeling it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you're definitely feeling it at that point. So anyway, I just think that's interesting and I wanted you to see. Um, like that's why you, you think about those things. Anyway, it, again, looking at an x-ray, if you're looking at an x-ray, we're seeing the distal end of the radius here, the distal end of the ulna. Y'all can see it, these long bones, there's this plate, isn't there? But also, not the carpals, the carpals are a little irregular, little bones, but the metacarpals, you can see epiphyseal plates, 
you can see on the phalanges, these plates, um, and these bones. And you can tell from the even x-rays sometimes if they're closed or not. All right, so um, we had talked about, and I know some people were out, but we had talked, and you might not have gotten to listen to the recording now, but we talked about those, gl those glands that the nervous system is going to communicate with to keep you in homeostasis, blood calcium homeostasis. We talked about the thyroid gland releasing calcitonin. We talked about the parathyroid glands releasing parathyroid hormone. And we talked about the kidneys releasing calcitriol. And so we're going to know, we're going to need to know how to explain that and what is going on with that and what cells they're encouraging the production of. They don't just do it. Those hormones don't just target stem cells to become either osteoblasts or osteoclasts. Those hormones are also targeting other areas. They're targeting the intestinal system so that you will, you know, just because you eat something that's got a lot of calcium in it doesn't mean it's going to be absorbed. As, mm -hmm. you, how many of you have eaten things before and they came through the other end 30 feet later unchanged? Mm -hmm. And if, nobody, if somebody doesn't raise a hand, I don't believe you. You weren't paying attention because we've all had that happen, right? We've all had that happen. Same thing when we eat foods. Even if we're eating healthy foods, what hormones you have targeting your intestines are going to play a role in what's going to come in. If there's no parathyroid hormone in your system, <coughs> you're not going to absorb the calcium. I don't care how, how much you're eating or taking. So these hormones are affecting other areas as well. They're not just targeting the skeletal system. They're targeting the kidneys, as far as what they let go as waste and what they keep in. They're targeting the intestines and how much you absorb. You know, we have to learn these systems independently because you can only talk about one thing at a time. But we understand they're interconnected and, and there's a lot of different things going on. And with that, with that in mind, do you think we know it all yet? And what they might be doing? No, we're discovering things all the time. As I say that endocrinology, the study of the endocrine system, hormones, we, it's like a baby science right now. We're just babies on figuring out what's going on. Yeah, we know a lot about hormones, and we know a lot of hormones, but we're discovering new things all the time. Great. All right, so this is fun. Are we having fun yet? All right, look, when we think about when we think about this, this pace of osteoblasts and osteoclasts, we said that it has to, it, they have to be equal. If they're not equal, can there be problems with yes. this? I want you all to tell me, I know you know, and it's somewhere in your notes, um, I want you to tell me what the term ectopic means. Ectopic. Okay, good, good. So outside of where you expect something happen, right? And we, we've heard that term a lot with mostly probably with ectopic pregnancies. Mm -hmm. So pregnancies that are de developing outside of the uterus, usually they're going to be in the bloating tubes. And that is back in the day, that was automatic death to the woman. Automatic death. Life-threatening, that was, that was, you're done. But now, with emergency services and emergency care, this is going to be an emergency surgical procedure and you have to remove that bloating tube and that developing um, blastocyst. It's not an embryo until it's in the um, uterus, but, and it never got to the uterus. But you've heard of ectopic pregnancies. They're very serious, they're emergency situations, and they're death without the emergency surgery to the woman. Now, um, there's also something called ectopic ossification. And ectopic ossification is when you are laying down bone outside of where the blueprint should be. So let's see if this sounds like it would be a good thing. We certainly want bone where the skeletal blueprint should be, right? Mm -hmm. And we want bone continuing to be made. Mm -hmm. We understand that it's going to be dissolved and replaced, but we want it continuing to be made. But what would happen if you started building bone in the brain? And brain tissue. What would happen if all of a sudden you started building bone? It could be microscopic, but even microscopic, should it be there? Should you be building bone in your lungs? Should you be building bone in your arteries? Should you be building bone in your muscles? No, those were totally different tissues, weren't they? They did not, they, there was nothing about bone in those tissues, right? 
but that can happen. And that's called ectopic ossification. And that can happen. Sometimes it can happen too, even in the blueprint, but it would be like the blueprint got changed. So um, the bone can malform as it's, as it's being remade, remodeled. So there's a problem with the remodeling process. And so that can be, that can be a serious problem. This is a condition known as achondroplastic dwarfism. And achondroplastic dwarfism is a dominant trait. What does that mean? They have the material to uh, express it. Exactly. That's what it means. This can happen two ways, achondroplastic dwarfism. It can be inherited, which means that you had a parent that had that trait. If the parent had that trait, were they a dwarf? Yes, because that's what dominant meant. And they could send it to the offspring. If they were heterozygous for that trait, if she's heterozygous for this trait, what would be her chance of at each one of her offsprings, what would be the chance for each child of them having that trait if she was heterozygous for that trait? 50%. Because she could either send that home or off, or she might send to heterozygous, so she may send the other. So it would be 50%. Is that right? Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm just seeing genetics. That's good. That's good. But it can also happen as a spontaneous mutation. So two normal parents that don't have that trait, when they mate, their zygote, this can happen as a spontaneous mutation in the zygote. And would that, would that offspring have that trait? It's dominant, so yes. If that spontaneous mutation occurs, it's a dominant trait, that offspring will have that trait. So two different ways uh, of getting this. Now you, you look at this person and you think, okay, well that's fine. We learn normals, and when we talk about abnormals, it doesn't always mean that they're diseased or disorder. You know, it can just be an abnormal, right? So there's no judgment on that, really. But in this particular situation with achondroplastic dwarfism, um, there are obviously, there are some things that can actually uh, happen. And this, this situation, and you should know, it's the long bones that are affected, not the other bones. So if you notice, her, her thoracic and abdominal cavity are, aren't really affected. Her head's not affected, are they? They continue to grow at the right pace, but the long bones, are going to close off early. Now, uh, there are sometimes some issues like joint issues, joint issues and those type of things that can lead to problems. Otherwise, it's an anomaly, uh, you know, whatever. But anyway, so that's that. Now, uh, I, this is the, okay, so this is the ectopic ossification in your notes you could refer to if you need it. Um, and then, you know, FYI about how braces work and whatever I'm not going to talk about. What did I tell you? I told you calcitonin. Um, calcitonin decreases blood calcium levels by encouraging osteoblast and osteocyte activity. Then I say that and growth and obviously development. You would think that's going to be really important. But don't we continue to keep that drug? And we kind of do. But what did I tell you also encourages it? Mechanical what? Compression and stress encourages osteoblast activity. So um, there are other things that can encourage this. This is showing you about blood calcium levels and talks a little bit about that. And these slides I think are just important for you to look at because it gives you the visuals of what carpal pedal, carpal are the wrist bones, pedal referring to the feet, the feet can contract too, but you'll sort of see this. And you'll think at first, oh, they're just like, they're, they don't feel good, they're just in a fetal position. But make sure they're not really contracting, right? Um, so anyway, let's go back and look at the hypocalcemia. This I had told you can lead to what? Tetany, right? Tetany. And, and so you all see this. Um, and when you think about this, calcium is going to be really important for nerve communication. So you're looking at this and you're, you're seeing that it's going to actually cause those motor neurons to become more excited. This is why you get the sustained muscle contraction. So, and looking at this, hypercalcemia is going to be depressing the nervous system. 
whenever anything, you hear about anything that stimulates or depresses the nervous system, it's a serious thing. It is. Whether it's a legal drug, whether it's an illegal, illegal, whatever, it might, whether it's internal, whether it's a, uh, an infectious disease or an infection that can cause a depression or stimulation of the nervous system, whether it's a metabolic disorder like diabetes, these are serious things. Anything that, that excites, overexcites, or depresses the nervous system are serious things to be thinking about. Because which, which system is it that keeps us in home and safe? The nervous system. So just can't talk enough about that. Those were the hormones being mentioned. I've already mentioned to you calcitriol. I told you that the kidneys are gonna release this. And this is going to be helping us to end up making um, vitamin D. Then uh, with UV light, it's just getting enough exposure to that. Usually doesn't take too much each day for us to have enough of the vitamin D. Which supposedly um, developed countries are in a crisis right now for vitamin D deficiency. Why do you think that is? You think it's our kidneys aren't, aren't working? The kidneys are working, but we're not getting enough sunlight because our lifestyles are so, you know, indoors and, and you know, just whatever. We're just not getting enough exposure, daily exposure. It's not, doesn't count what we get like maybe a week all, you know, in some, it's daily cut time types of exposure to keep levels level. Was that redundant? To keep levels level? But anyway, yeah, absolutely. So that's, that's why. And I have talked about calcitonin, we know, parathyroid hormones and parathyroid glands. And then we know there's many others. There are many other hormones. I talked about estrogen, didn't I? I talked about estrogen and I understand that estrogen is going to get, girls are going to um, get home pretty quick, but then they're going to stop, right? Uh, because of this, males grow much longer. Other vitamins, if you don't have those vitamins that we said, and, and minerals and all those things that you need in your diet, it's going to be pretty impossible too, to um, build bone. So you've got to continue to have that in your diet. Anabolic steroids, we know can cause early closures of those bones early. So, um, y'all have already had an insight about anabolic steroids, haven't you? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you've already heard that they adversely affect almost every organ system, don't they? Mm -hmm. but, but there's also synthetic steroids that we get. Prednisone, how many of you have been on prednisone before? Okay, so prednisone is a, is a uh, drug to help with tissue repair and healing, and sometimes you've really got to get it. But is it something to consider, especially the, the adverse effects? You know, so there's no such thing as a safe, completely safe chemotherapeutic. So we always have to, in medicine, always be trying to educate the um, patients or whatever on, you know, why they're getting the treatment that they're getting. They're not just being written scripts willy nilly. Uh, that there's really a lot of thought and consideration going in because honestly, all of the things have consequences, but you have to weigh is the treatment going to be needed enough that it outweighs potential consequences? And, um, you know, something to be thinking about. Okay, so that's fractures and repair. Do y'all have a I do, too. <laughs> I do too. Some of you had long breaks because of the test. Um, but can we take just 10 minutes? How about that? And we're going to come back in 10 minutes. Let's do 10 minutes. Okay, guys. So, um, so we'll, start, we'll start back here with this fractions and repair um, of bones. You know, fractures can happen either because of stress or because of trauma. Or pathology. So these are two different reasons to break broken bones. And certainly, you would want to know which you're dealing with. So obviously, um, trauma, falls, that type of thing, uh, car accidents, whatever. Uh, they they can break bones, but but don't forget that also pathology can sometimes happen. We had talked about um, osteoporosis as being the most common bone disease, didn't we? So uh, with osteoporosis, the bone health is, is the reason that the bones are, are breaking, but it can also happen because of bone cancer. And you all will see osteosarcoma is one of the most dangerous cancers that we know. Um, it can, you know, sometimes there's no rhyme or reason as to why it happens. Sometimes it happens because of exposure to radiation, but it is an aggressive cancer, it can happen at any age. And so, um, 
what you can see happening there when that does happen is they're typically going to remove that where that is. And so they're going to remove that appendage or whatever. And they have to be aggressive in the treatment for that because mortality rates for osteosarcoma are so high. So um, fractures can be for any of these reasons. Now, the, I don't. I don't think honestly. I don't think I asked you this ever. I don't, I don't think I do. But but they're just described. They actually are called by what they are, what they look like. I do ask you one thing, and this is I do sort of test you on this one thing. When you hear about open or closed um, reductions, when you're here talking about that, these are usually surgical repairs. So if it's a uh, open reduction, it means that it's gone through the tissues, it's gone through muscle, it's gone through skin, you know, it could have affected the nerves. So there's a ton of, of damage that's been done that could have possibly been done. If you can have breaks and bones that end up um, affecting like arteries, and is that going to be an immediately life threatening thing? Mm -hmm. Right, so all kinds of collateral damage can be done in these open, um, open breaks, but also in the open reduction for the surgical repair is happening, they're going to go in and put in pins or maybe potentially or screws or plates or those types of things. So um, if it's displaced, it just means it's not lined up, right? If it's not displaced, it means it's broken, but is it still in line? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's all that means. And if it's transverse, what do we know transverse means? straight across. If it's oblique, what do we know oblique means? At an angle. So if we were to hear these terms, we would know. Spiral breaks. Spiral breaks can happen sometimes, not always, certainly not in the leg, uh, you know, what you're looking at here, the lower leg. But sometimes spiral breaks can, could indicate what? Abuse. Sometimes they can. Uh, especially if it's like the arms, it can, but not not always in the lower limbs because little kids, are, they got, or quick, I call them quick feet, they've got quick feet, and so sometimes they'll just slide out, you know what I mean? And it, because they can do that, um, sometimes you'll see, but usually if there's a spiral break in a the child, they're going to probably be asking tons of questions, uh, potentially. All right. Um, and then, then you have green stick, which is like you trying to break a green stick. Does it really break very well, or does it just maybe, if you got to look real close, it might be like a little splinter area here. So that's all that means. Comminuted means shattered. That's what that means. So when it's shattered in these different types of pieces, you're, still, you're certainly going to probably be looking at an open reduction, aren't you, uh, and trying to fix that linear, just a line and a line. And then two doctors have sort of described these very kind of common breaks. These are very common breaks, the coals and the pot breaks. This is, uh, the coals fracture is on the wrist. What's the most common bro bone broken, by the way? You would think that since I just mentioned the wrist. And when you think you're falling, what do you try to do? Is catch yourself. And so again, that's a physics thing about motion and energy. You know, and that energy stop right hand that causes the breaks of the distal radial um, radius and ulna sometimes will break both of those. Lines. But actually, the most common broken bone is the collarbone, is the um, clavicle. That's the most common bone broken. But again, that's a physics thing because if you fall and catch yourself or you're doing something, that energy moves through and then it stops right here at the sternum where that clavicle is butting up against the sternum. So it kind of stops right there and it causes a break in the clavicle. But anyway, clavicles can be broken when you're born too. So, um, so that's actually a uh, not an uncommon thing. It's, it's in childbirth. It's called shoulder dystocia. Dystocia is a term that just means difficult labor uh, in this case. So shoulder dystocia is that um, you know usually when you deliver the head, you know you deliver the head, you can do the rest. You can do a marathon after that is done, right? After the head, except if your shoulders are bigger than the head. And so if the shoulders are bigger than the head or the presentation isn't right, then you gotta know what you're doing to look at those shoulders or you can break the clavicle. And if it's usually not a big deal, they don't have to do anything. The fetus is the, the neonate now, not a fetus is born, the neonate's gonna be okay, and, you know, just probably get told that the clavicle is broken, it's gonna be okay. Um, but if it breaks and it damages these nerves, could it end up affecting a lot? Yeah. And it could. And so, um, so you have to, you do have to be careful when 
of a woman is delivery and you hear about shoulder dystocia. You might want to suggest different positions to get into to deliver, you know, hands and knees or squatting is the best position to deliver. Um, you know, being on the bed is the worst mm -hmm. position to be in. So um, anyway, you might have to just move around and, and have somebody helping with that shoulder, the shoulders, and y'all probably have seen that. So anyway, that's the colds though at the wrist, which is pretty common. And then the distal fibula, this is the fibula, which doesn't, isn't really supposed to be taking um, weight. That the, what's taking weight here is the tibia, but the fibula is an axis of strut, sort of a lateral strut. So it's up there on this, the fibula, it's on the sides here, yeah, right? Um, and this distal, this distal end, if the ankle gets turned too weird or too much pressure, then it, uh, that's a common break. That's what they show me, Max. So I don't think, other than knowing what an open reduction means, I don't think I ask you anything too much about that. And I don't ask too much about like the normal process of healing, except that we found out so much about it that in orthopedics in the last decade, there's been this revolution of change. It used to be, uh, y'all probably don't remember it because you were but it used to be that casts would stay on twice the length of time they could keep them on hand. Just a 10 plus years ago, they started having, cutting half the time the cast were put on. Because we really don't need it. And what happens when you keep the cast on too long is you start losing all the supporting structures. The muscles, <coughs> the vessels are being affected, not to mention the skin. I mean, you've seen what skin looks like after a cast has been on a bit. So, you know, it's just a lot, a lot of stuff that you're now hurting and you really didn't need to cast on that long. So just to give an idea, and again, I don't ask about it, certainly but though with an injury, they were going to bleed into it. And that's okay, that's normal, that's a hematoma. So you're going to be bleeding into this because vessels have been broken and ruptured. But with the new vessels that are coming in, you're going to pretty quickly form a soft callus. And when I say it's a soft callus, it isn't, it isn't spongy soft, but it's, it's whatever. And it does not have to be fully healed before you remove that cast. So they'll remove the cast early now, but they'll say, you know, don't take up full activity again, because you know, it's still gonna take a couple few weeks for that to finish off. But they did know that it was doing a lot of damage. So in orthopedics, so much has changed. It used to be that with surgical um, with surgery, orthopedic surgeries, you were just hoping to relieve pain. You weren't really like, you weren't really even trying to get that full range of motion or full whatever. You just wanted to get rid of pain. So I don't know, some of you might remember like the shoulder people having rotator cuff surgery and, and um, knees or, you know, just whatever, back surgeries. They were really just trying to stop the pain. And sometimes they were even, you were going to even lose mobility. But as long as the pain was gone, people were going to be pretty happy about it. But now, now they're doing amazing things. There's no such thing. If you have an orthopedic that says that you're going to get 100%, then you've got somebody cocky to deal with, and that's okay. But, but there's probably not 100%. Because once we injure something, do we end up usually getting a look, some fibrosis? Mm -hmm. Especially if you get some, so I don't know about 100%, but, but definitely people are doing really amazing things in orthopedics. And so now you're not just hoping to relieve pain, you're actually really hoping to get mobility back and um, whatever. So a lot is going on in orthopedics. Make sure you know what that term means, orthopedics, right? Okay, uh, this just shows you a picture of some of these pins and plates that can get put in. Sometimes they'll leave them in and sometimes they don't. Uh, sometimes they'll leave them in and think that they're gonna leave them in forever, but then you have to go back and take them out. But whatever, there's a lot of different things that they can do. So you can, guys can see that's kind of transverse, isn't it? But is it this place? Mm -hmm. huh. So yeah. How many of you had broken bones? <laughs> did I ask the other day? I did. Uh, oops, probably won't have to say it today. I, I, if I say I've never broken a bone, I'll probably break one soon. But I haven't, that would be awful. What kind of bones did you break? Your heel. Your heel. Like, okay, that's a, that's a, I want you to look at the calcaneal bones. They're, they're just huge. Really? How did you do that? Can I ask? Do you know how to have a bounce house? And I bet you bounced out of the bounce house because you're bouncing when you're done. So, oh, wow. It's not really little. You were little. Those were great. Those were great. Oh, my God. 
ankle and elbow. And who else has broken things? Name and elbow. You know, that elbow, uh, that elbow can be tricky because if you break at the elbow, you can lose supination, pronation, supination, pronation. You can lose that ability just by falling. Do we fall on our elbows? We do. Um, but if you if you break it at a certain point, this actually can be lost. And if you have lost that, you I mean think you can't comb your hair, you can't brush hair without supination pronation. You know, brushing your teeth, you're doing that, right? You lose things, you actually can qualify for a handicap sticker if you lose that. <laughs> just, just I found that out and I was like, really? Uh, but, but you you act you lose you do lose things like Doorknobs, right? Mm -hmm. So, but y'all both, y'all got back that supplementation, pronation. Um, and what else? Who's up? Yeah, Alexis. I broke the middle finger. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you for clarifying what was happening. No, I just, it's okay. Yeah. So, softball, 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 I, they're often, and that's a, it's tough. I mean, yeah, it's serious, tough. serious sport. Yeah. I broke my shin bone in half when I was five. Oh. Which is, again, serious. I had a cast from my toes to my hip. Yeah, you usually have to immobilize to, you have to immobilize above and below. And then when I was so, about 13, I broke my foot bone. Good foot, like this bone. Yeah, foot. the metatarsal. So that, um, yeah. Same way. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I, I just I wouldn't think that would be fun at all. Um, My fiance broke his pelvis. So was that like a, just a car accident? A car accident. So um, yeah, horrific, horrific. The pelvis is protecting those pelvic organs, and you know the back and whatnot is a full recovery. Yeah, yeah. Everybody else had full recoveries. Kind of broke my nose. Ooh. You did take the so over me by some med pad. Yeah. So some yeah. Oh, uh, <laughs> see, I, I had a ton of scars, most of them were on my face. So I, I, and I said it was a dumb thing because we all had such heavy heads, such big heads. <laughs> so when we fall, gravity just made our heads hit first, <laughs> rebounds first before anything else. Uh, I was convinced of that. I had so many scars on my face. Um, so <laughs> But I'm no. sorry. That is one thing I didn't. I don't think I broke it. That was my nose. I don't think so. But I certainly teeth through chin. Okay, you know, eyes laid open, like 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 not how you should see eyes and uh, all kinds of things. Around your lip. What you said? <laughs> you had a bunch out there. Yeah. Seven brothers and sisters. It was not. It was <laughs> not their fault. None of those things were their fault. None of those things were their fault. It was just me. Um, it, no, they really did. Um, but anyway, osteoporosis, we talked about, we said that, you know, it is usually postmenopausal, smaller white women. We do think about, but we don't close our minds off. We understand this can happen in other situations too. And sometimes you'll, you'll remember me and say this because there'll be times that you'll be thinking, uh, you'll get a diagnosis and you think, that, that person should have had that. That doesn't end that, you know, um, and you'll realize that you had been thinking that because you usually learn about certain diseases being in certain groups, but don't close your mind off because it can can happen in other cases as well. I have a question. Um, yeah, I was on the phone yesterday with somebody who just got diagnosed with osteo osteoporosis, but osteo. I think she said pneuma or something. Yeah, osteopenia. Yeah, yeah osteopenia. This this is kind of penia just means low, so it means that she's got like her counts are going down. So there's some blood tests they can do to see. Um, so she's at risk yeah, she for osteoporosis. Really, yeah, like, she so, she's, really so she's very much at risk. Yeah. And so um, hopefully they are trying to do something to maybe boost that. She also got um, gastroparesis too, so it doesn't help. So uh, gastroparesis where things aren't moving through empty, your stomach's not empty. Um, yeah. yeah. But you got some stuff going on. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and so, definitely, definitely, people who know that risk. But there are behavioral things we can do, not just medication and not just nutrition, but nutrition, nutrition so important. But did I? I think I told you, or maybe I didn't. But if, if you have a physician that or clinician, so you know, mercy, 
that was um, graduated more than 10 plus years ago, they didn't have a nutrition class. Does that just blow your mind? They didn't have a nutrition class, and now we know how important you know nutrition really is and like what role it plays in healing, the healing process, but also in being proactive in preventing um, preventing disease. So you know, my well, hope. I hope they do okay. But yeah, this is these are some of the effects. So even in this picture, this lateral view of this, this woman, you see it's a, a lighter skin, older, small um, woman, female. And you can see this is, like you might look at this and think, wow, that looks terrible too. No, that's kind of normal. So even this much less is going to really put somebody at risk. Um, so this is osteoporosis, and you can see the beginning of kyphosis here, maybe not just the beginning, kind of advanced kyphosis here. And when you think about that, you might be thinking, well, is that just aesthetic? No, of course not, because the curvatures of our spine are such that we have protection of these vital organs. And the lungs, for the lungs to be able to move the way they're supposed to move, um, for blood vessels and for nerves to function the way they're supposed to move as they move through these areas, they're going to be compromised if the curvatures are off, so uh, which sets them up at higher risk for those diseases of those systems, respiratory diseases, those types of things. So it's going to be important. Now, so what causes the body to hunt, though? Uh, okay, so the vertebral column, which you're going to see in this next chapter, the vertebral column is bones, right? And so there's bones, and if those bones become weakened, then they can't, the, even the musculature is affected, so there are going to be exaggerated curvatures um, for that when that happens. Let me let me show you because we actually chapter eight, chapter eight guys, except for like three or three or four things that are physiology. Chapter eight is all anatomy, so it's like naming bones. So um, it's really just anatomy. So we I go through this pretty fast, okay? Now there's some things that are physiology, and I want you to make sure you get like that curvature, exaggerated curvatures. I am going to want you to know those exaggerations and where they are, and the curvatures of the spine, what their names are, the disorders, and I would want you to know those, and a couple of other things. But other than that, we're just going to be kind of like naming bones. And I would love it if y'all would say them out loud after I I kind of go through them, because does it help you to learn? Yes. Yeah. All right. So. Now look, we have an entire, we have to do all of a &P, so so I, we don't have a whole four credits, a whole semester with just bones. But what you guys are going to be learning are the most, the basics and the most important things about them. So please get this as you go, because then if you go into orthopedics, you go into a specialty, if that's what you end up in, then you will have a good foundation and you will be able to build on that, right? Uh, you'll notice that your list, when you, I gave you that list, it doesn't have 206 names for the 206 bones because many of the bones have the same name. You have a lot of ribs, but guess what they're called? Ribs. ribs right? <laughs> so, exactly. And you have a lot of metagarchals, right? Bones and phalanges. You have proximal, medial, distal phalanges. <laughs> right? They're all separate bones. And then you have right ones and you have what left, left ones. ones okay so on our so that's why it seems like a lot of numbers you know you think 206 bones well yeah yep yeah, you do have those but a lot of them are right and left <laughs> right correct um or groups groups like vertebra and when we get to the vertebra you'll see this even more so sometimes i learn i get you to learn the groups of the bones names uh, and so you would have to know that and it would be on your list, right? But also, maybe as important, and, and people kind of don't really get this, but they should, maybe as important are these features of bones. So there are a few of these I really want you to know, uh, like fossa, I want, and you'll sometimes see this without the E, this is the Latin version of it. But anyway, a fossa is a depression in a bone. Now, do you think depressions are in bones just willy-nilly, or do you think they're serving a function? They're definitely serving a function. The function is usually to cradle whatever organ might be there, right? Really cradle. And when I say cradle, I mean what? Oh, protect and, and, you know, give support. And yeah, exactly. So a fossa. 
I want you to know the term foramen. If you ever see foramen, you know it's a hole in a bone. Now, do you think that holes in bones, again, willy-nilly, or do you think they're serving a function? Yeah, so usually their vital structures go in through here, like nerves or blood vessels. Uh, an example, does anybody happen to remember the other day what this bone was called? Occipital. occipital. That's exactly right. Y'all got that, the occipital bone. And you told me the muscles, not that we're doing muscles yet, but we're just sort of teasing. The muscles here is called what? Occipitalis. Good job, Alexis. So we said if we learn these bones, is muscles going to be easier next week? Yeah. I can't believe this is going. But if we learn the bones, the muscles are going to be easier when we get there. And that occipital bone, I gave you something in parentheses to, to know. And that we said anything in parentheses means a region on that bone. Didn't I? And one of the things I gave you was the form and magnum. And sometimes you'll see that reversed just because it's Latin. But anyway, a form and now what? A hole. And it's big. It's big, right? What do you think is coming through that hole? Spinal, Spinal cord, right? So we'll see. We'll see the term foramen. We'll know. Uh, in the in the mandible, there is a hole here on the other side. It's called a mental foramen. And I had a student once tell me this, and I, I didn't forget it because I thought it was a great thing to remember. You know how when you're thinking, you go. Hmm. <laughs> It is called a mental foramen, and by the way, guess what the little muscle is that's over it? The mentalis. Okay, I'm just saying, just saying, learn these now, right? Learn these kind of things. The reason I have them on your list is that, that it helps you later. But anyway, so a foramen. Then I would also want you to know, I would also want you to know if you see, and spine is kind of obvious that something's got a spine to it, but anyway, a process is a projection. If you hear the term process, it's a projection. It's a projection. And you will, in your, um, in your parentheses, you will see phobias, uh, condyles, and epicondyles. You'll see those. But anyway, I, there are just a couple that are there, so I want you to just look at those. I told you, what do you learn first, though? What do you learn first? Names of the bones. Then go back and look at the things in parentheses. And you take them region by region, don't you? If you ever hear the axial skeleton, it just means that what's on the axis, which is the medial line, the medial line. Appendicular means to the side, you know, um, means appendicular. So, you know, out, out from there. Um, and we're going to start, I, we started the other day with the skull, didn't we? Did we start with the skull? We did. And we said, I told you that usually those are the names of the bones that people are least familiar with. So we kind of had started there. But when we look at the cranial fossa, what do you know these fossa, these depressions are protecting from this lateral view? Um, I mean, protecting the brain, isn't it? It's, it's holding, it's cradling the brain. If we looked at it from a superior view, <laughs> you can really see those depressions, can't you? Those fossa. Okay, so just looking at the frontal bone. Tons of pictures. Do we want to look at a picture just one way, just anterior? No. We would want to look at it from the side, lateral view, wouldn't we? Maybe even a mid-sagittal view. Isn't that right? So you want to look at a ton of pictures. You want to look at the whole thing. You know, you want to look at, um, I'll have, I'll have people, and I'll tell you all this is a heads up. I'll have people, because I can't find pictures that don't have lines on them. And I wish I could. I wish I could just find pictures with no lines. But I can't find, even from my resource here, I can't, often can't find that. So what I'll, I have done in the past is, you know, I'll give the pictures with, that have lines with nothing labeled, and you have to label certain things. But I'll have somebody who, who if they'll see the frontal muscles, the frontalis muscles, but that there'll be a line going just to the bone, and they'll link, they label the muscle there because they were like, you know, but I want you to be looking at the whole structure and know that you could draw your own lines because you know where they are, exactly where they are. Okay, so you'll see you'll see more of that when I, we get to the muscles. I'm going to show you some of those. Um, but anyway, so this is the frontal bone, and it actually does fuse after birth, and and we do know that. In the frontal bone, there's also a sinus, and I want you all to know what a sinus is. That singular sinus. 
pleural sinuses. Okay, so a sinus is a cavity. Is a cavity. It's a cavity. Do you see this huge cavity here? It's huge, isn't it? Mm -hmm. On this mid sagittal section. What would sinusitis mean? Inflammation. Inflammation of the sinus cavity. Now you have more than just the frontal sinuses that you're dealing with. You have more than just those. These two, because remember you have two of these. Yeah, you know, we're just seeing we're just seeing the left one right there, aren't we? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is how many of you get sinusitis and this is where it hurts. Mm -hmm. Anybody? But we also in the maxillary bones, we have sinus cavities. <coughs> so how many of you get sinusitis and your teeth hurt? Me too. I, that's where I get the, these is because of here. These cavities should be filled with air. You should know that. They should be filled with air. Not mucus, not liquid. But if you have inflammation, what comes to the side? Fluid. And so if fluid builds up in here, just put build up pressure. And does it hurt? Can it make you feel bad? It can. So uh, let me let me tell you this. This is one of your physiology things in this chapter. So sinusitis is inflammation in the sinus cavity. There are four different skull bones that have sinus cavities, and they're all the sinus cavities you have. These four different skull bones. We know one of them is the what? Frontal. One of them is the maxillary bones. Then the sphenoid. And by the way, there is a picture of this. It's a picture in your, y'all have these PowerPoints available to you, don't you? Here they are. You guys have seen them. And then the ethmoid. So these are what the bones, these are the only bones in the skull that have sinus cavities. Sinus means cavity. And when you have sinusitis, you have one or more of these cavities affected. One or more of these cavities. It doesn't mean they're all affected, but you have one or more affected. This is what I want you to know. I want you to know that most sinusitis is from allergies. By far and away, it's allergies. The next, next most common cause of sinusitis, or the etiology it means cause, the next is viruses. A virus, cold viruses. There are more than 200 different cold viruses that we encounter. So colds, viruses. The rarest of all causes of sinusitis is bacterial. But when somebody thinks they have a sinus headache or sinusitis, what do they demand of their physicians? And do they work? Usually not. Usually not. That doesn't mean they don't get better when they start taking it, but it's just, it's just they were going to get better anyway. What works more efficiently are nasal washings. And you should definitely use the cell or sterile water. It should be warm, should be saline, you know, salty, saline, sterile water with nasal washings. Definitely work better. Right? Antibiotics are rarely needed for sinusitis. Uh, we're over prescribing antibiotics. So these are the sinus cavities, which we know sinus means cavity. And the other day, we kind of went through these bones. Didn't we go through the bones? We said frontal, then we looked at parietal say. Are you supposed to be putting your hands where the bones are? You really are, because does that help you remember? It's one of those things that helps you remember. You let somebody else touch you, and you can touch somebody else with their permission. That'll help you too. So temporal, temporal. Um, how about occipital, we said, right? Occipital. The sphenoid, you can actually see the sphenoid bone. If it's a butterfly-shaped bone. You can see it from a lateral view, which I don't seem to have a lateral view. You can see it a little bit, but the best view is going to be this inferior view. It looks like a butterfly-shaped bone. The cool thing about the sphenoid bone, it does have cavities in it. So some people have, feel like their eyes are going to pop out of their heads when they have sinus infection. Have you ever felt like it? And you bend over and think, oh, wait a minute, I'd like to keep my eyes, right? <laughs> so um, the pressure is so great behind my eyes, the sphenoid bone. But it also has this little place in the sphenoid bone um, where you can't really see it too great. But it is protecting like a pearl, your pituitary gland. So your sphenoid bone has that. I don't ask you that. But anyway, the ethmoid. The ethmoid, you can see from the um, medial orbits. But the best way to see the ethmoid bone 
is really going to be like straight through the nasal thing. And look how, look at this. Look at this ethmoid bone. Look at all the little air and, and ethmoid sinus patterns here, right? So um, that's that. Maxillary, we said, are holding the upper teeth. Isn't that right? And the maxillary cavities, look at the sinus cavities of the maxillary, maxillary bones. Now, what was here before you matured were teeth. If you ever looked at, and I think I have a picture, if you ever looked at a child's skull, um, there were pictures of a child's skull, they, these are just, the whole bones are just filled with teeth up in here, right? Um, but then as soon as the permanent teeth come through, those are just cavities. The palatine bone is not on your list. I probably should have it on your list, but you all have heard of a soft and hard palate, haven't you? You've heard of that. But these are palatine bones. I don't have those on your list just because I don't have a good, great model. Uh, the zygomatic, what do we call them? Say it. Yeah, but what, say zygomatic. Zygomatic. Guess where the zygomatic is minor and major are coming from? These cheekbones. Those are muscles, okay? Those are muscles. So when somebody gets to the muscles and they label the zygomatic as minor down in the foot somewhere, guess what I know they didn't know? The bone name. Because with the bone have helped them to know where it was. Yes. At least the area. It would have gotten them in the right area. The lacrimal bone, what did I give you as a hint to know the lacrimal? This is on the medial aspects of the orbit here. But we said the lacrimal glands, which are up here, secrete tears that wash across our eyes. And this, in this bone, there is this duct where the tear duct goes into the nasal cavity, right? So this is the lacrimal bone, isn't it? Okay. Um, great. Nasal, nasal bone, you know, and we know the end of the nose is actually um, cartilage, isn't it? Does anybody watch that show Botch? Yes. Okay, I'm a little addicted. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Uh, I, I just love the nose. I love those because that's tricky, you know. That guy fixes a lot of bad mistakes that have happened to people's noses, um, sometimes through injury, but also from people who've had um, bad surgeries. But the nose is tricky, isn't it? Anyway, um, okay. And then a vomer. I have the vomer is, is something I do. This is this is going to be actually what you hear about a deviated septum. Um, you, you hear about this. This is forming that lower inferior half of that nasal septum. So this is the vomer. It's a uh, you'll be able to see it on the skull that I have the colored skull that I have. And the mandible I told you is the only bone in the skull that moves. Right? It's the only bone that moves. The mandible. Um, and this is that mental foramen. And then, you know, we have these different areas of this mandibular. This is a mandibular notch. This is a process, right? So it's going to end up fitting here in this fossa on the temporal bone. Y'all will be able to see how that is. And you'll look at those regions after you've learned all the names of all the bones. Because if you learn all the names of the bones, you will pass the bone lab. You will pass it. But you do really well, will you have to get the regions too? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Guys, this is the hyoid bone. This hyoid bone that sits on the um, superior edge of the glottis here, this, this trachea. Um, and this hyoid bone is the only bone in the body that doesn't meet with another bone. That doesn't mean it doesn't have important functions. It has really important functions as far as muscle attachment and movement here. But but this is the hyoid bone. This is the bone that they look for when somebody has um, died to see if it is crushed. Because if it's broken, it's, you'll see how fragile it kind of looks. But if it's broken, what would it indicate? Maybe somebody had been turned. Yeah, somebody had been turned. Right. I want you all to know a uh, word called fontanelle. A fontanelle is, the, or fontanelles, but a fontanelle is a space between the skull bones. So neonates have a lot of them, don't they? Neonates have a lot of fontanelles. Why do babies' skull bones not meet? Why do they go Because they've got to go through this area, and they're just like, they've got to mold, don't they, mm -hmm. through the birth canal. And they have to be able to do that. But also because the brain is going to have to have place to grow. Um, you sometimes will see neonates born and the bones are fused. Mm. The bones are together. 
this is a problem. They're going to have to put spacers in, go in and put spacers in. But y'all know, anybody who's ever had a baby knows that the first thing they do when you get it for your well checks is they may lay them on the scale, but what do they do before they even get the weight? So they measure that head, don't they? And they want to see the head doing what? Growing to grow. Being able to grow. So a fontanelle is what people call soft spots, especially this, up, this upper one. This upper one between the frontal. See how the frontal hasn't joined yet? But between the frontal and the parietal, because it's a significant area, isn't it? You can evaluate that soft spot just from looking at it. But you also can evaluate if the child is dehydrated from it. Why? Because it's something. It'll be something, won't it? It'll look like it's something, won't it? That will be it. And, and obviously, fontanelles are sort of these important functions, but they also are weak, you know, Achilles areas of, for a baby. And this is why baby's heads need such protection, right? Um, okay. Now, so fontanelles are just those natural need to be there spots, these soft spots between skull bones that haven't come together yet to allow uh, a baby's brain to grow, but also a head to get through a birth canal. Uh, and if you look, the skull reaches adult size by about eight or nine. You know, kid, kids are really disproportionately heads, aren't they? Yeah. You know, when you think about it, they really are. Their heads are just way bigger than, um, than whatever. But it makes them so cute. All right, now look, the vertebral column, like I said, you have 206 bones, but a lot of them are vertebra, <laughs> individual vertebra. So what I'm going to want you to know, and I have it on your list, I, I'm sure, but what I'm going to want you to know is if you were, you know, I think most of y'all would have known if there was an individual vertebra sitting on a table, you would have picked it up and said, that, that looks like a vertebra, right? Mm -hmm. um, because they do have certain things in common, but... If you ever really look at them, and I want you to on the articulated skeleton today, and by the way, the through the lumbar, not the sacral and the coccyx, but through the lumbar, I'm telling y'all this, I will have these together. And it doesn't make sense to you that no two of these look exactly alike. Because do they each have slightly different functions? Mm -hmm. They actually do. I mean, they basically have the same functions, but, but they have slightly different What's your, what's your first uh, cervical, because cervical means neck, doesn't it? What's your first cervical vertebra need to look like your last lumbar vertebra? Mm -hmm. Because this is holding up your head, but the lumbar is having to take all of it, right? So you see the body of this is much thicker, isn't it? This L5, and they're numbered by, they're numbered that way. So C1 to C7. You have 12 thoracic vertebra, five lumbar vertebra. Do you think you need to know that? Yeah. yeah. So you, you're going to just learn them as a group. So I would have maybe a number here. And I won't, I won't do it like at the first or the last ones of it. I'll have it kind of in the middle. And you would say that this, is the, this group are lumbar vertebra, right? Or a number right here, and you'd say what? Thoracic, thoracic vertebra. Or a number on one of these, and you'd say cervical vertebra. Because there are seven cervical, 12 thoracic, and five lumbar. Now, you also have sacral vertebra and coccyx. But I'm going to have these, I'm going to have these um, together. Because the sacral vertebra, by the time you're late 20s or early 30s, they fuse. Those five sacral vertebra have fused together. Same thing with the coccyx. The coccyx, the four little coccygeal vertebra, by the time you're, you're late, late to early 30s, depending on the person, they've already fused two together. But they're all vertebra. All right, now, now, what I want you to know, too, are these curvatures. When we are born, we don't have the musculature <laughs> that has formed the curvature. So when we're born, you're said to have a C curvature, which is essentially means you collapse. <laughs> you know, you don't have anything because you just collapse, right? But what's one of the first things a baby can do? Start to do what? Start to lift their heads. And as they start to lift their heads, as they start, as a baby starts to lift their heads, the muscles are going to pull on this, and you're going to get a curvature here known as the what? Cervical curvature. After babies, you know, they'll start lifting their heads. 
they'll start to be pushing kind of up and pushing over, is that right? And then the musculature is going to help with this thoracic curvature, which goes the opposite way. And then the lumbar goes this way. And then this pelvic includes the sacral, really the lower part of the lumbar, but anyway, the sacral and the um, coccyx. And that goes this way. So you have four curvatures, don't you, as an adult? Do you? And do you see? Now look, that's what you have to have for protection of these areas. But not just protection of those areas for the visceral organs, but look, look, look at this and see if it doesn't make sense. Between, y'all told me that, that what's being protected here is actually the spinal cord. Or did you tell me that? You know that. You know that, right? It's the spinal cord. But what's coming off the spinal cord? Peripheral nerves. Who said it? Peripheral nerves is, are coming off. And in between these vertebra are what are called intervertebral foramen. What's a foramen? It's an opening that allows the spinal nerves to come off of the spinal cord. So if you don't have these just right, would it affect the size of the opening? Could it potentially affect the size of the opening too? And then what would you be pinching? Spinal nerves. So this needs to be, it, it needs to be curvature, but they, the, the angle of them and the, the degree of the curvature has to be just right. The degree has to be just right. You don't want anything exaggerated. So here's what I'm about to show you, and you do need to know all of these. The most common problem with the vertebra is that, and y'all can't see it from where you're sitting, but it's in your textbook. They give a little ghost of where this should be. The most common deviation is lateral deviations. And when I say lateral, that means to the side, right? So instead of this being a nice straight vertebral column, you have these lateral exagger exaggerated deviations. This is a deviation in the thoracic region. Do y'all see that? And this is a deviation in what region? Lumbar region. Now look, do you think with this deviation, this is gonna affect the lungs and how the lungs and the nerves? Do you think it's gonna affect the intervertebral openings, the intervertebral foramen openings of the spine, the nerves? It's gonna affect a lot of stuff. This is called scoliosis. This is scoliosis. About 20 years ago, and some of y'all think 20 years, it wasn't even 20 years ago, the American Pediatric Association said we were in a crisis that our young kids were getting uh, diagnosed with severe scoliosis at alarming rates. The number of reported scoliosis were just jumping by crazy amounts. Why do you think it was? That didn't make them stand up straight. When you look at, when you look at, don't you want to like stand up straight just so you breathe better? Uh, or <laughs> It was because we had in our K through 12, especially K through 8, we had them bringing book bags that they had to take their books, all their books home. Mm -hmm. and, and so when they realized that that was going on, that you had a child who had a book bag on, a, a child shouldn't have to pick up more than 10% of their body weight. So you've got a, a K through 3, let's say, who weighs 40 pounds, and they shouldn't be picking up 20 pound book bags and carry them for any length of time. So that's what was happening, and they stopped that, that practice, and guess what we stopped? I mean, it really, a, a, a message went out to all the elementary schools and said, don't require kids to be taking home all those books at night. And they also, about that time, guess what started happening? Mm -hmm. The little roller book bags, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that started happening too, so some marketing people got in on that. But anyway, and, and the numbers started to come back down and stabilize. But scoliosis isn't just from doing that. Scoliosis can be inherited. It can be because of other disorders. Scoliosis is not that uncommon. Part of the pediatric um, protocol when you're looking at in people, when they start toddling, you should be watching them, especially if they walk away from you with no diapers on or anything. I'm talking about toddlers. And their folds should be bilateral. So their little gluteal folds, their little buttock folds, the little, you know how toddlers have like this, no, that one. Uh huh, that's where you want to hide it. So anyway, they have those things, but they should be bilateral, shouldn't they? 
Their shoulders should be, as you, as you watch them, their shoulders should be even, their shoulder blades, right? The scapular regions, those little, those little depressions should be even, gluteal folds even, they should be bilateral. Um, if anything starts to get off, you would want to see what might be going on. So scoliosis. This is kyphosis. Do you see where the curvature should be? Do you all see where it should be? But it's exaggerated, isn't it? So kyphosis, I do want you all to know this is uh, often a symptom of osteoporosis, but it's also called different things. It's called a widow's um, hump, and which is, you know, sort, sort of a sexist kind of, I don't know, what, like that, what, older women who've lost their husbands, but now now women and men's lifespans are about the same, so I don't guess we can call that. But anyway, and it's also sometimes referred to as a dowager's home, but again, same thing to widows, dowager, older women. Um, do we have make, names for older men that we can say? No. Um, that was just a joke, but uh, okay, so that's a that's kyphosis, and then lordosis is you have an exaggerated lumbar. And the reason that this is happening is because people have weakened abdominal muscles. Your abdominal muscles, if they're strong, you're going to have a good lumbar curvature. But if abdominal muscles are weak, then this is going to affect this. Um, and then when that's happening, is this going to affect the uh, health of the pelvic organs? Yeah. yeah. So uh, scoliosis, kyphosis, and lordosis, will you be asked? Yeah. You will be asked. So why do they, for scoliosis, um, why did they, like I was checked, I think in middle school, like they had at yeah. the end, they checked everybody, why did they okay. do that age? Um, and not earlier since you can. Well, pediatricians should be doing it early. Okay. So pediatricians should be doing it, certainly middle school age too. I think that's, a, that's, that's definitely something um, that you want to be looking at as well, because there's a lot of growth happening during that time too. There's a ton of growth that you, you a lot of adults end up getting a diagnosis for scoliosis, you know, and they've never been told that they did and have some slight. Now, the slight scoliosis, you know, they may be given some PT things to do and, and whatnot, but you also see people, like, especially middle school age, too, where growth is happening and scoliosis is severe enough that they'll have to put in a rise. Yeah, they, they may have to wear braces, like wear braces even when they're awake and sometimes at night, but sometimes they have to go and put in rods. And then um, the Lord, the last Lord one, is, Lord is, is that is that what happens in the pregnancy too? Um, for like a slight variation, you know how like it kind of doesn't your lumbar kind of is to help in the in weight the, increase. And the um, last part of the last trimester of pregnancy, you release a hormone called relaxin, and that hormone relaxin actually loosens all your joints. That hormone is relaxed, it is relaxing, and this is why some women were said to look like they waddle, you know, because they're, they look like they're waddling a little bit because all the joints are being affected by this. Um, and it's mostly so that the pelvic osteopathy can move. So it really is, because that adjusting for that head uh, to come through the birth canal, humans are the, are the we are the, have the most dangerous birth. And it's happening because we're a bipedal. And because we're a bipedal, um, the angle of that of that pelvic, um, the degree and angle, our our infants have bigger heads than other primates, and the angle that they have to move through is narrow. So we do have the most dangerous deliveries, but we have things in place, and you know it's very natural and we just don't work out of okay. But anyway, the relaxing helps that hormone that's released in that third trimester helps all the joints to loosen up so that that movement can happen. So I, I don't know if that's what you're talking about. You know, I, I think about, and this is what I thought, so I don't know, it's not <laughs> but, but who would want to have blood implants? I don't even know that. <laughs> okay, but like who, to, like I don't even get it, but you know, if somebody could sit a plate on their butt, that's not an attractive thing. It's not <laughs> It's probably not healthy. You know, it would mean that your abdominal muscles are somehow compromised. Okay, so I don't know. I'm old. She has a question. Am I old? Does it have to do with blood implants? I hope it does. It's not. Okay, good. It has to do with Okay. Um, my cousin, she had scoliosis. She's got diagnosed when she was like really little. Um, when she was 14, she had to go in and they had to do 
plates and screws mm -hmm. from her neck down. Mm -hmm. Sure, it's the um, whole way down. Right, sure. she had it done the whole way. Last year, she found out she got she didn't do anything. Um, she started complaining that her back hurt, and she started walking sideways again because, of course, it fixed it. Mm -hmm. um, and she started walking sideways, and her mom took her back because by then, like the pain had gotten a lot worse. She couldn't sleep mm -hmm. anything. It had actually her spine had pulled the plates and, and pulled the weights on the plates and screws. So they yeah. had to go in and open her again from neck down and do the surgery all over again. But of course, it damaged. Like she has no feeling in her right arm, all the way down her hand. Like she can use it, but like she can't tell you if you're touching. Touch it, but she's lost some of the sensory. Yeah. Like yeah, she can maybe. pick up a pencil, but she can't tell you how tight she's squeezing it. That, she's that's going to be important when we get to the muscles, too. Yeah. So we're going to talk about innervation and the nervous system. You have special nerves with sensory and then nerves that are promoter. And you can have damage to one and not the other. Yeah, so you might you can move, but you might not be able to feel as well. So anything that's doing like that, but, you know, that, that's what I meant about any treatment, whether it's a chemical treatment, chemotherapeutic or whether it's a physical treatment has risk doesn't it so you have to weigh and um, that wasn't necessarily anything somebody did wrong in the first surgery it's just how her body responded to that so you know and there's no going to be no guarantee that the next one they did is going to stay either that's what they told her but her spine is so curved they, they have to do it they have to do it because when the spine is like that you can get end up getting collapsed lungs, serious, serious issues. Um, you know, vessels are going to be compromised, so it's going to lead to more like hypertension, kidney. I, I mean, every, almost every organ system can be affected by that. So, you know, yeah, that's sad. Because, yeah, I've seen a couple of those. I haven't known any pers personally anybody with that severe, but I've seen them in the hospital with that severe, having those surgeries. Um, but I've also heard of good outcomes, like you know, people who have the rods put in, and they that's that. Now you know, understand if you have the rods put in. We had movement, you know. Obviously, I shouldn't be moving at these days for y'all showing y'all things, but y'all know you can curl up like a ball. We had movement in our vertebral column. You don't think of it being a lot of movement, but we had movement. But when you put those in, you've lost it. Well, hers was in sections. Like they did so, it, so she they did it so a little bit point. between. Yeah, yeah, they did it to a point, but of course, whatever. Yeah. And they don't think she did anything to cause it to fall no. apart. She thinks they just think it was her spine was so bad. Yeah, just yeah, that it was going to do. It was growing that way. Yeah, it yeah. happened within three years because she had just hit puberty when she had had the surgery done. And now she's 17 and just had it done again. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Bless her heart. Bless her heart. Us having drones and like looking down. Oh, yeah. It's I like just read it today, but like they're saying that the money else are going to have back drones because of that. Or probably a lot of them already do. Right? Yeah. Like it's going to increase. Like, so they say, they said when you have your phones, you should have it straight out so you're looking at it. Because this is like a natural record for your neck. That's why I like a lot of this stuff. I mean, that's all they don't look good. Yeah. <laughs> 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 or we can just do it from above. <laughs> all right, I know y'all need a break again, and I need to go set up the lab. But um, whatever. What is that? I just want to look. Um, so, so this is what we're going to be doing in the next hour and a half or so. It's going to take me about 15 minutes at some point to set this up, which I'm going to do. You all are going to be in here with the bones, okay? So I'm going to bring all, we're going to let you all bring all the bones here, the disarticulated ones, the skeleton, the articulated skeleton, and then the skull that y'all like to do So you can do it in groups, you can do it by yourself. You can do it and saying from one region at a time, right? Just really, really concentrating to get that. But I'm going to be bringing that once I get this set up over here, I'm going to be bringing y'all in like six or seven at a time. After I get the scope set up, each station, let me tell you how it's going to be. Each station with the scope on it, I'm going to have the slides covered up and I'm going to have it focused. You are not allowed to touch the focusing on the scope. You aren't allowed to do any other focusing. If you're not focused, that's why I'm in here. And it's only going to be six or seven of us at a time. You call me over and if you say, I just can't see anything here, I'll try to figure out what's going on. Okay? 
I've almost never had to touch it when people were able to see it. I'm always impressed with how well y'all do. So the station's going to have a number, like on an index card, it's going to say, like, station one. You are going to, I'm going to hand you an index card when you come over there. Only thing you're going to bring with you is going to be a pencil. Everything else you're leaving here, I'm going to leave these two doors open. So, so y'all are going to come in, and you're going to put your name on your index card, then I'm going to you write numbers one through, and that, by the way, it's going to be eight stations. One through eight. Okay? Now, one through eight. You're going to, you can start anywhere there is somebody else. You cannot come up and get inside somebody while they're looking. If somebody's at a station, don't go near them. Right? Right? You wait until they are clear, and then you can go after they leave that station. You don't have to go one through eight. You can go to station four and start, but make sure that you put it on number four's line, right? Fair enough? All right, so that's how that's gonna be. I wanna let you all know, because I'm sure y'all will be taking breaks and doing whatever. The nurses down in the nursing lab are doing free blood pressure screenings. I'm going right now. Because I want it done, I want my done. So they're gonna be doing those from 11.15 until like one or something. But if y'all want to take a break and go down and have your blood pressure checked, that would be good for the nurses to be able to do practice with y'all. Uh, and maybe good for you to know too, right? Um, so they're doing that, and I'm going to go do that, and then I'm going to come set up. We good? Mm -hmm. When I, after I get my blood pressure checked, I'm going to go by my office and get the key and come back through here because I want y'all to get the bombs out. Right. Yes, question, Nicole? Lecture quiz Tuesday or oh. yeah. So lecture quiz Tuesday is gonna be anything we've talked about to this point that has to do with what? Um, okay. Anything that we've talked about that to this point that has to do with bones. And was there another quiz I was, oh it's skin. There's a skin. Nicole. You, did y'all know y'all just weren't telling me? Give me that picture of that skin. Where is it? So okay. I gave you all a colored picture of skin, didn't I? I gave you all this colored picture, and I told you just which, which things I wanted you to do, right? And you won't have any more than this. You won't have any other things that I didn't give you to do, right? So thank you, Nicole. Yeah. So we didn't with, see, this is, you, actually, y'all should all thank her, because th should this be a 100 for everybody? So is this going to help everybody's lab quiz grades? Yeah. So on Tuesday morning, you'll have both of those at the same, you know, I'll just hand them both out. And so on Tuesday morning, you will have the skin lab and electric quiz on both. All right. Everybody happy?